Well, hello there, everyday Americans. You know, not that long ago, I was asked a question. And I thought I'd make a good episode here for the Facebook Live. And it, it dealt with the question of, did the southern states have a right to secede from the Union or not? And how does that impact those who seem to be calling for the state of Texas to secede from the Union? Well, we'll take some time and discuss that here next on the Constitution Study. There's one thing you have to know wherever you make your stand. Came from a long through line of everyday Americans. Hello there, everyday Americans. Paul Engel here once again with the Constitution Study. We are live on Facebook. I am glad you could join me, especially if you're joining me live. Uh, there is some news coming up about the Constitution study. Uh, hopefully that will include better Facebook live productions. Uh, I'm working on a way to make this uh, work a bit better. As always, though, head over to the website constitutionstudy.com to find out everything that's going on with the Constitution study. There's a lot going on this month. Sign up for the newsletter. Um, I send a newsletter out once a month, let you know what's been going on. I've got some, should be some really good announcements coming out for the December uh, newsletter. So head over to constitutionstudy.com. You'll see the button in the right hand side that says sign up for the newsletter and I'll deliver that. Uh, I'm still looking for more content. So if you've got ideas, as always, I love questions. I love ideas. I love topics sent over to that website. Um, I'm putting together some new classes. So hopefully soon I'll actually be offering classes through the website. Uh, Again, there's a lot going on. It's been keeping me rather busy. I'm glad you could. You know, I'm glad you're spending some time, and I'm looking for other ways to for you to engage, both with me personally and with others of like mind. Uh, as always, I want to thank everybody that helps put this on. Whether it's the band Rebel North that lets me use their music, um, the people at uh, Constitu Constitutional Grassroots Move It, Restore the Intent conversations on the culture that help spread this message if you can help spread the message please do uh, i really enjoy i enjoy hearing people say hey i found your website or i found your podcast and or somebody pointed me there and i thought it was great and i have a question for you so that's uh you know i i, I thoroughly enjoy that and with that let's start talking about secession now I can. I already checked. I've got comments on this post already uh, that I'll deal with in just a minute. But let me start right off the bat. There is no language in the Constitution about secession. There are no standards set for when a state may secede from the Union, and there is no process for a state to do so. But there's an interesting question, because states are sovereign entities. Now, since they joined the Union voluntarily, you'd think they'd be able to exit the Union voluntarily as well. Well, finding nothing in the Constitution, I went to my next go-to reference, the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist Papers. Now, the Anti-Federalist didn't mention secession at all. However, James Madison in Federalist 58 thought that having too many members in the House of Representatives would foster the, quote, baneful practice of secessions. See, he was concerned that if you, if the, the House of Representatives had too many people in it, um, individuals and even states would basically say, no, we're going to pull out as, as, a, as a form of leverage. And we'll see more about that as we go through this a little farther. So after the Federalist and Anti-Federalist Papers, I went to the constitutional debates and I searched for discussions on secession. Uh, you can find it's in the Library of Congress. You can actually search the entire debates. Now, early in the debates, there were talks about changes needed to the Articles of Confederation, and a concern was raised. And it was raised by the fact that commissioners from the de for the delegates from Delaware prevented them, I'm sorry, commissions from the dele for the delegates, prevented them from agreeing to any change to the rules of suffrage for the states. So of all the delegates that went to the, to the convention that was originally meant to uh, amend the Articles of Confederation, Delaware delegates were specifically prohibited from voting for any change that would change the suffrage, the voting rights of the states. Governor Morris noted, actually, let me pull this up here. Governor M Morris noted over here. 
And there. That the valuable assistance of those members could not be lost without real concern. And that so early a proof of discord in con the convention as secession of a state would add much to the regret. So you remember, we weren't talking the Constitution yet. They were still talking about amending the Articles of Confederation. And Governor Morris said, listen, if a state secedes from this process, if they back out of the Articles, if they back out of the, even the process, the, the, the convention, that'd be such a proof of discord that it would really show the states were fractured. Uh, it would not be a good look. It would not be a good situation. The idea that so early in the process a state would leave the convention, much less the union, well, that, that'd be a real problem. And remember, the delegates were working really hard for unanimous decisions. But for a state to secede would show so much discord in the convention that the whole convention would fall apart. And if that were the case, we wouldn't have a constitution. Now, during a rather raucous debate about a comment about the powers larger states may wield over smaller ones, Elbridge Jerry said, if no compromise should take place, that will be the, uh, what will be the consequence? A succession, a secession he foresaw would take place, for some gentlemen seem to decide it on it. Two different plans will be proposed, and the result no man could foresee. If we do not come to some agreement among ourselves, some foreign sword will probably do the work for us. Now, he's not so much worried about the reputation of the debates or the of the convention or even of the union. He's worried that the union will fall apart. John Francis Mercer, he was concerned that the secession of a state from the convention could be used at a critical moment to endanger the government itself. Now, later, while they were debating how many members should be in the House of Representatives and how many of them would con con constitute a quorum, Mr. Mercer stated, so great a number will put it in the power of a few by seceding at a critical moment to introduce convulsions and danger the government. And by the way, that typo was actually in the, the, the minutes, which is why it's there. Now, this goes back to what Madison was saying. You see, the baneful idea of secession is that it can be used by the minority to manipulate the system. You know, you'd have, say, some great debate going on in the House, and you could have states just say, well, you know, we're just pulling out. We're giving up. No more. That would throw the entire government into convulsions. It would throw the entire country into convulsions. It, it could literally endanger the government. And if you want an example, take a look at what's going on now in Great Britain. Uh, what happened recently, or what happens just about every other year, it seems, in the state of Israel. Now, granted, they have a parliamentary system, not a constitutional republic like we do. But what you see is when people say, you, you see parties going, no, we're done, and the government fails, and they have to go through elections and make um, deals to put together some coalition government. It literally endangers the government. And that's not what our founders wanted for us. So the, 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 the simple idea of a state seceding from the Union was considered not just bad, it was considered awful. It was dangerous to the whole country. And they were really concerned that states would use it for political reasons, political machinations. The states would do so would pose an undue influence on the Union. And again, not just looking at other countries, look at what's going on in Washington today, where we now have, um, we have a, a party not a branch of government, not a house of a branch of government. We have a party in a house of a branch of government that is a trying to overturn an election and not really providing much evidence for it. What happens if one of the states or states controlled by a certain party were to simply say, nope, we're walking away. We have none. That's kind of why I think our founding fathers did not provide a way for a state to leave the Union. 
if you look at the way the Senate runs, now the Senate is not constitutionally required to have cloture and filibuster votes. That's their own rules. It's allowed because the Senate's allowed to make its own rules. But look how that has been used to manipulate the Senate, where a minority of senators can tell the majority what they can do because they will not invoke, they, they will not allow them to invoke cloture without it. And since the parties nowadays really seemed, seem for the most part unwilling to actually go through a filibuster, you have a minority controlling the majority. See, I believe the answer as to why our founding fathers did not include secession in the Constitution comes from that Mercer quote. If states were given a method of seceding, it would be human nature for people to use that power, in effect, to blackmail the rest of the states. We see the polarization, not just in the parties, but in the states nowadays, would you really be surprised that a California or a New York or, or an Illinois or a Florida would threaten secession to get their way? We've already seen people asking Texas to do that, right? It's not a party thing. People tell us, you know, hey, they want Texas to secede or you know, they want to at least talk about it because they don't like what they're doing. It, 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 literally is a method of fracturing the republic. And as uh, Governor Morris noted, besides other mischiefs, if we can break up, up a quorum, they may seize a moment when a particular part of the Constitution may be in need of immediate aid to extort by threatening a secession some unjust and selfish measure. And really, look at Washington. Would you expect anything else nowadays? Do you really think that, you know, a, a party that's willing to go through the impeachment process would not be willing to secede from the union to get their way? And again, I'm not simply picking on Democrats. Republicans do the same thing. It truly would be dangerous to give them that power. It would literally give a single state the ability to coerce the other states it would allow the tyranny of the minority over the majority that I've been talking about that we see in the U.S. Senate. I imagine a country run the way the Senate does, unable to do anything unless you can get three-fifths or two-thirds of the senators to all agree. Just as a minority of senators could thwart the will of the majority for whatever the reason they wished, or for no reason at all, Imagine what happens if states had that power. See, now this was tried in 1860 when 11 states claimed the authority to secede from the Union. Now, although the states were sovereign, they'd agreed to the compact that is the Constitution, which did not give them a method for exiting. At the very least, since states can only be added to the Union by Congress, Article 6, Section 3, an argument could be made that they can only be released from their obligations by Congress. And that's something that did not happen in 1860. And again, it's something that's not even discussed in the Constitution. Now, as I said, there's I've often heard talk about Texas seceding from the Union. By the way, I used to live in New York State. I've often heard talk about asking New York City to secede from the Union. Now, people who talk about Texas seceding note that Texas was a republic before it joined the Union. In other words, it was its own nation. And somehow that's supposed to give it some unique positioning to allow it to leave. However, each of the original 13 states were also their own nations before joining the Union. See, it's not a matter of the, what state the land is in prior to joining the Union. They agreed to be bound by the Constitution and to give it supremacy over their own laws and their own constitutions, as you read in Article 6, Clause 2. Or, the way marriage is supposed to work, till death do they part. Now again, in 1860, states which were unhappy with the new president, Abraham Lincoln, they started talking about secession. 
labeled an act of war by some and predicting armies coming to steal their property, say Dred Scott v. Sanford in 1857, several states unhappy with the current political environment in Washington illegally broke away from the Union rather than continue with the political process. And by this action, they started a war. Now look at the political discourse in Washington, or what, what passes for political discourse in Washington. We have states that are unhappy with our current president, Donald Trump. We have claims about corruption and illegal use of federal power. And we have threats of impeachment, with as yet no evidence presented of any actual proof, any evidence of the claims made against the president. Now, if you follow me on the Constitution, said, you know, some things I agree with him, some things I don't. But what I see is a process not that much unlike what we saw in 1816. Now, imagine if the states had the authority to secede from the Union. What do you think would happen? See, if those in political power would use impeachment as a tool to overturn an election for political reasons... Is it not conceivable they would use a threat of secession as well? Imagine if states like New York and California could threaten to secede from the Union if the representatives of the other states did not vote for impeachment and the senators did not vote for conviction. Do you think Washington, D.C. would be more or less dysfunctional under these circumstances? See, contrary to what some have said, there is no legal way for states to secede from the Union. And I, for one, am very thankful for that fact. See, it pressures states that are unhappy with the current circumstances to continue to work through the political process rather than just take their ball and go home. And I don't know if that was the absolute intention of our founders, but I think it was a wise decision to not allow states to leave because of the reason it would be used, uh, the political machinations that would be considered. Now, there's one other thing I want to, before I go on, and they did it to me again. I'm looking at some of the comments here. Uh, you know, I don't know. What we got on here? Okay, let's see. What have we got? They. I'm looking at some of the comments here. I'm sorry. I had this up and uh, the Facebook, I had it set to show me all comments. And then Facebook just decided to change that on me and they're hiding some of the comments. One of the things that I want to do is. Uh, all right, let me talk about it. There's one comment that I got before the show opened that I want to, to, to answer. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Vernon. Uh, Vernon, you know who you are. We've had several disagreements on, uh, on, on Facebook. And uh, I agree with Vernon. States cannot secede. Um, they are bound by the Constitution but what's interesting is, he says the Constitution is not a compact. A compact is merely membership in a club, a matter of convenience that can be canceled or ignored at will. Uh, there's only one problem, Vernon. Um, you're incorrect. See, now again, I, tend, I like to go back to um, uh, actual dictionaries. And I looked up, compact, noun, an agreement, a contract between parties, a word that may be applied in general sense to any covenant or contract between individuals, but is more generally applied to agreements between nations and states as treaties and confederacies. So the Constitution of the United States is a political contract between the states, a national compact. So uh, those of you who insist that the Constitution is not a compact, uh, I'm sorry, uh, you're incorrect. That's not what the founder said. Uh, again, uh, you know, that's Webster's 1828 dictionary. No, Webster um, uh, compiled that so that we would have our own, um, uh, we'd have our own version of English. Um, 
this is a compact. And it's actually important that it is a compact because that means it's a contract. It's, it's legally binding. Um, it has, it, it should be treated like any other contract in the con contract law. So, uh, having it being a contract, actually a, a compact is a, is a good thing. It's what makes it, uh, what makes it legally binding. So let's see, I'm going to see if I can pull up some of these questions. Again, if you have questions, pop them in the comments. Um, I love answering them. I love seeing what we have here. Uh, what we got? Contract law should be looked at. Yep, legal recourse. Uh, I'm thinking Adam was saying that we wouldn't have a constitution. Yes, we wouldn't have a federal constitution. Uh, the states have constitutions. Um, yes, I was referring to we wouldn't have, you know, if, if, if the Delaware delegates seceded for the convention, Yes, we would most likely not have a federal constitution. Uh, interesting, the only constitution I'm aware of that's older than the federal constitution is the constitution of the state of Massachusetts. Um, the federal constitution is, the U.S. constitution is the oldest national constitution in existence, um, but Massachusetts constitution is earlier. And that's actually a very interesting point. Um, if you read several of my articles lately, uh, and if you listen to a couple of my podcasts, there's a lot of confusion about the First Amendment and people applying the First Amendment to the states. There's a problem. See, now, before people get into the selective incorporation doctrine, um, Article 6, Clause 2 says the Constitution is the supreme law of the land and every judge in every state at the state and federal level is bound to it and they have to put it above the state law and above the state constitution. All right, so there is no question the Constitution, all of it, applies to the states. But when we read the First Amendment, it says Congress shall make no law. That's a very important phrase. Congress shall make no law. So if you look at some of the things we, I've been writing about, um, uh, so-called First Amendment issues, uh, very often what we're actually dealing with are state constitutional issues. Each and every state of the union has an equivalent of the Bill of Rights in their constitution. So um, uh, that's a very good point that the constitution, the states have constitutions. Uh, it just, we wouldn't have the, we, we probably would still be under the Articles of Confederation if it lasted that long. Okay, uh, we could... So let's see. Kimberly says, I wish they could secede. Texas is not the, the rest of the U.S., so it's not blackmail with us. It's cold, hard fact. We are the only state that could function on its own country. Um, as I said, the original 13 states were original 13 countries. Uh, Texas could no more. You know, every state technically could go back to being a state. The problem is what happens when uh, Texas now has to compete with California when it's negotiating, uh, say, foreign trade. So you got to remember, California is more populous than Texas. California's economy is larger than Texas economy. Texas, do you really want to be competing with California when it comes to trade with, say, um, China or um, Europe? And when people invade Texas. Now, again, this is Texas. You could probably defend yourself pretty well. But that would mean you'd not have to only defend your border with Mexico, but uh, your border with the rest of the states as well, because you'd be a, a completely separate nation. You would not have the treaties that were negotiated. Now, granted, you wouldn't have the problems, but there's a, there's a, a point that I really want to make. Um, Texas agreed to become part of the union. Texas agreed to become a party to the compact that is the Constitution. And that contract doesn't have an exit clause. So uh, Kimberly and, and others from Texas, I, I know you have a lot of pride. I almost, when I was looking to leave New York State, Texas was on my uh, list of places to go. Um, didn't quite make the cut. Nothing against Texas. But um, I, I had a job opportunity in Tennessee that brought me down here. But it, 
simply saying you could do without, um, I don't know that that's necessarily the most helpful process. Uh, the, it is the union that is the biggest mess. Texas has its issues. New York has its issues. Tennessee has its issues. Every state has its issues. Um, but we all agreed to try to work together. And if we are going to just walk away when we don't get our way, then this union would not have lasted 100 years, much less the 235 years it's lasted so far. So uh, let's see. Are we getting any other questions, any other comments in here? Uh, let's see. Adam says the first constitutional convention was established in my state. Adam, I'm assuming you're from Massachusetts. And actually, the Massachusetts Constitution, it's it's interesting. I've read parts of it because I did an article on something that happened in Martha's Vineyard related to freedom of speech, among other things. And um, you know, so I actually went to the Massachusetts Constitution and said, hey, you've got uh, good protections for uh, freedom of speech and freedom of the press and freedom of the religion. And in fact, many of the state constitutions I have done that research on, uh, their protections of those three freedoms, uh, religion, speech, and press, are actually more detailed than the one in the U.S. Constitution. So that's kind of cool. Yes. Yeah, so the yeah the the first part it 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 is it's the first it, the 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 equivalent of the Bill of Rights is the first part of I believe every I haven't researched all fifty states. Every state I've looked at so far uh, it's in there. That's uh, but wait there is one. Oh, what state was it? It's actually way down there, and I can't remember which state it is um, that actually has uh, many of the freedoms, many of the Declaration of Rights farther down. It's not actually the first. It's not actually the first item. Uh, so let's see what other question we got in here. There is no exit clause. However, where in the Constitution is there a prohibition against the states on secession? Well. Um, where in this is, is the states on succession? Hmm. There is no language about secession in the Constitution. It, it's, there is none. It's not there. Um, now, that said, uh, interesting question. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I, I think we've had this discussion before. Uh, the 10th Amendment says that any power not given to the federal government remains with the states. Um, but we're back to um, how. See, if you have a contract without an exit clause, how do you exit? And I've had to deal with a few contracts in my career, and that's that that really is, uh, I think, where the problem would, would arise is what is the mechanism for exiting a contract? See, unlike the 10th Amendment, which says um, the, the states have given certain authority, certain powers to the federal government, and they retain the rest for themselves. When they've joined together, um, what is the legal mechanism for them to break apart? So it's... Um, and again, since a state doesn't join the union all on its own, in other words, it's not something they sign up for like Facebook. Uh, it is something they ask to become part of and have to be agreed upon by the other states. It is a union of multiple sovereign states. So the only way that I could see a state having any legal authority to actually exit the union would be for Congress to petition for, for an, a, a um, Congress which invited, which, which approved the state joining the union to ask the other states to say, will you release this state from its obligation to actually be part of the union? Um, again, I, I, to me, it's a, it, I, I don't see, um, it's not necessarily the, a simple answer, but I think it's one of those. You know, there's a lot. There's a lot there, and um, 
yeah, I, I, I can't, I can't, the, 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 again, the problem is the other states should still have a say in what's going on. They join together. Shouldn't they come out together? Uh, so let's see. Uh, oh, there's an interesting name, an American patriot behind enemy lines. I'm sure there's a lot we could get into that one. Uh, yeah, all right. So uh, the American patriot says, you know, it's scary to know how the little people know about the Constitution. First of all, I know that. Uh, that's actually why I started the Constitution study uh, when I started seeing how little people actually knew about the Constitution. Um they talk about Facebook messing with their First Amendment rights. Well, that's kind of what I was saying. The First Amendment limits Congress. Now, there's a whole other question about um, Congress delegating power to the executive branch and, and the mess that, that has made. But you're right. Facebook cannot violate your First Amendment rights, not only because it's not Congress, but because it's not a government. No one forces you to join Facebook. Now, yeah, Facebook has a large percentage of the market. You're, you're, you know, I, I, as a small business person, um, I have to deal with Facebook, even though I don't necessarily want to all the time. But that's not the same as, you know, Facebook isn't going to show up with goons at my front door and guns saying, you haven't signed into your account this month. All right. Uh, I, I love the people. The ideas are people who are trying to um, set up alternatives to Facebook. And I love that idea. I, I want uh, I, I want people to enjoy freedom of speech on these platforms. And I want to see um, uh, I want to see people figure out better ways of doing things. But uh, yeah, you're right. It's not a question of the First Amendment. And uh, you know, again, I tend to get picky about words. Uh, because especially when you're dealing with contracts, words matter. And uh, when we understand what the words actually say, sometimes it may not say what we want, but it makes a tremendous difference in how the system actually works. Uh, so Jesse's back. Secession is a, uh, some people have argued that secession is a breach of contract. Okay. Well, yeah, basically. Um, ah, enter. All right. So, uh, however, couldn't this also be the other way around? Well, uh, when the federal government breaches a contract of the constitution, how can the state be forced to remain part of a broken contract? This is a very important point, And I repeat it over and over again. Um, because the states control the federal government. Now, you wouldn't believe that if you went to school in the last hundred years, but the states created the federal government, not the other way around. So imagine this. Um, let's say uh, a bunch of us get together and we form a company. Uh, we're going to call it the, I don't know, we'll call it the Constitution Live Corporation Corporation. And uh, we hire uh, Facebook to do some advertising for us. And um, as part of that contract, they agree they're going to abide by certain rules and conditions. If they don't abide by the rules and conditions, is the proper answer to simply pick up our, our toys and leave? I don't think so. You see, that's actually the state abdicating its responsibility to oversee its own creation. The states created the federal government um, through the, the Constitution. If the federal government isn't doing its job, it's up to the states to step in and change things. It's why the Senate is designed to represent the states, it's, which is why they were originally chosen by the state legislatures, not by the people of the state. It's why impeachments are tried in the Senate. It's why the Senate approves all treaties. It's why the Senate approves all appointments, or not all appointments, um, most appointments. It's because the states were meant to have control over what's going on. It's why I wrote in my book, How the 16th and 17th Amendments Destroyed the Republic. Those two amendments, including the 17th, which gave us a popular election of senators really destroyed the relationship between the states and the federal government and really kind of left it um, kind of all out on its own. And, and it really has made a mess. 
Uh, so no, the answer is not for the states to simply um, go away and pout. It's for them to stand up, remind the federal government who created whom, remind the federal government who has what powers, and then enforce it. That's why I love, I, I've done a couple articles about uh, state officials standing up to federal overreach. Uh, Texas, go back to Texas. Uh, your AG had a, a great stand up when the, um, uh, what was it? House, some House committee was asking them to turn over election records, and the AG said, uh, no. No, it's not your purview. It's not a legislative function. You have no authority. We don't work for you. No. That's what a state's supposed to do. Uh, there's been a couple of others, but that's what I want states to do. I don't want them to back off because all that does is make things worse. I want them to stand up and say, uh, no, this is the rules. We're going to enforce it. Uh, let's see. John, uh, the Constitution is silent on states. Absolutely, it is. Beg's answer is this. How many states would have joined the Union to begin with if they knew in advance that they joined, they would never get out? I, th I still think the advantage of any state staying far away is a disadvantage. However, the gap means to be closing rapidly. An amendment to the Constitution is in order to clarify the point. If the state does want to secede, then it certainly may secede. So the question is, and it, listen, John, it's, it is impossible to answer what might have been. But by looking at the, and, and go back to the beginning of the broadcast, when we read about secession in the debates in the Constitutional Convention, uh, right from the beginning, the idea of a state backing out, even of the convention itself, was thought to be a bad idea. If the states backing out of the union was thought would be uh, politically abused. So I think the answer is all of them. All of them would have stayed. All of them would have joined because they understood that um, this was an important thing to join. And if we were to give a state a power to secede, it would be used for political gains and it would be a detriment to the other states and to the union as a whole. So personally, although you can never prove what never happened, uh, I would say the states would have joined because that's what their delegates were debating in the Constitutional Convention. I believe an amendment to allow states to secede will be the beginning of the dissolution of the union because you'll have states that are leaving in pizza fit. Uh, you're going to have, uh, you know, California. We already have states that say we're not going to do business with other states. We already have states that say we're not going to go to, we're not going to spend any money in North Carolina. How much farther to say we're just going to leave the union? We have states that are already saying, if you don't do things a certain way, we're not going to uh, allow certain legislation to happen. We, If you don't vote a certain way, then we're just going to try and get rid of it. How much farther would it be? How long do you think it would be before the Californias and the New Yorks and the, the Vermonts and the Illinois and these simply said, then we're going to leave? Uh, you know, how long do you think before you'd have a U.S. exit? And the union would disintegrate because none of the states on their own have the same political, military, uh, economic power as we do as a whole, not in the uh, in the world picture. So uh, I believe if a constitutional amendment is passed and ratified to allow states to leave the union, to secede from the union, that would be uh, the last straw. And you would see the union no longer just simply be dysfunctional, um, you would see it dissolve. It, it would, it, it would be, it would, to me, that'd be the beginning of the end. Um, uh, Dustin says, yeah, we want states to stand up, but a breach contract is null and void unless the parties choose to make amends. That's the point. The contract is being breached daily. 
and the states are doing nothing because the people in the states, A, don't know what the Constitution says, B, don't recognize that their rights are being violated, that the contract is being violated, and C, don't realize the power that they have to influence their own state governments. We've been inoculated from the facts. We've been educated into imbecility so that we don't know what these are. Um the 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 idea that the right answer is to have states simply walk away, um, again, you, you just wa- you'd watch it crumble. Look at how bananas Europe went when Brit when Great Britain said we want out. Look at what they've gone through to make that happen. The people of Great Britain voted to leave their European Union. And they still haven't left because the politicians know they're in trouble if that happens. The political class doesn't want it. Europe doesn't want it. What happens when states say, yeah, but we're out? It is time for the states, rather than encouraging them to leave, we should be encouraging them to stand up to educate the citizenry on their rights and their responsibilities and to stand up and start making sure that they are doing their job to enforce the contract that they are a parties of. Remember, the states are the parties to the compact. The federal government is the product of the compact. It is time for the states to stand up, and they're only going to do that when their citizens make them uncomfortable, remind them of their their oaths of office. I get a lot of reaction. You know, it's, it's politics season. It's election season. And I have people recommend uh, uh, candidates to me. I do not endorse candidates, but uh, I do vet them for people. I do. And I always ask them, what are you going to do to to fulfill your oath to support the Constitution? And the vast majority of them give me nice platitudes. There's very few that actually show they have an understanding of the Constitution and the role the states are supposed to have and say they're willing to stand up and do anything about it. Um. You know, it's, uh, I guess, I guess the way, uh, you know, a thought just came to mind. Um, you know, sure, if the Titanic, if the Titanic is going down, then it's time to get in the lifeboats and leave. But everybody gets on the lifeboat and leave. You don't get half a dozen people saying, you know what? We don't like it here on the Titanic anymore. Uh, we think it's going the wrong direction. So uh, we think it's heading into an ice field. So we're going to take a lifeboat and leave. How long do you think they would have survived in the open ocean that way? How long would the Titanic, you know, the, the, it was only when the Titanic was going down that people actually left it. And while the country's in bad shape, I, I agree. I, I talk about it every day. I don't think we're sinking. I don't think we're beyond the the point of no return. We are in serious, serious trouble. But if we're all ready to give up on on the United States of America, then let's just admit it. Let's stop talking about, oh, we're going to allow secession and its states' rights. Let's just admit the union, the experiment in self-government has failed. The union is coming apart, and let's just all go our separate ways. Because that, that is, secession is the beginning of the end. And it's there because the states won't do their job, and the states won't do their job because the people won't do their job. And uh, Dustin knows, uh, I'm, I'm, looks like I'm going up to North Dakota early next year to teach middle school uh, students uh, about the Constitution. Um, we're trying to get that all worked out. Because it's important that they they learn because they're not being taught in schools today. It's important that we all learn. Um, because if we don't, um, like I said, uh, let's call it quits. Uh, let's see. Adam, Massachusetts Constitution. Government is instituted for the common good, for the protection of the safety, prosperity, and happiness of the people, and not for the profit, honor, or interest of any man, family, or class. Therefore, the people alone have the incontestable, unalienable, and indefensible right to institute government and to reform, alter, or totally change the same when they are uh, when they are safety, protection, prosperity, and happiness. Well, when they're okay, uh, Adam. Yeah, the Massachusetts Constitution says was actually repeated very similarly in the Declaration of Independence. Said 
All men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, that governments are instituted among men to protect these rights. Actually, to protect these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And when government becomes detrimental to these rights, it is the uh, right of the people to alter and abolish it. It's saying the same thing. And that's the point that I want people to understand. Government is there to protect your rights, not to give you stuff. It is there to uh, protect your rights, not to, um, uh, not to be your bully. That is, it is there by the consent of the governed. Now, consent's an important word. Because I can actively give you consent by saying, yes, okay. I can passively give you consent by saying, no, let someone else decide. So very often we get the government we have because the people consent either actively by voting or passively by not engaging. But yes, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish the government. That includes the state government and the federal government. We need to stand up and say, it's time for us to fix what you've been doing wrong. And if you're not going to do that, see, again, I say this over and over and over again. The people in Congress work for you. You hire them. You have the authority to fire them. They are your agents. They work in your name. Everything Congress does, you might as well have written your name on it. Even if you didn't vote for them, because you as a community agreed that was a person that was going to be your representative. That was a person that was going to represent your state. You all agreed, even if it wasn't 100%. If they work for you, if they are your agents, if they're working in your name, why don't you go kick their butt when they don't do the job you want them to do? Why are congressmen and senators not terrified when you pick up the phone and call? Why are they not quivering in their boots when their constituents show up at the office? Because we never bothered exercising our power. You want to get a congressman's attention, you work the vote to get him kicked out of office or her. You want to get a senator's attention, you work to get them kicked out of office. Now, if you do it individually, they don't care. But that's the purpose of getting together as groups. It's why I do these live streams. It's why I do my podcasts. It's why I do my articles. It's why I spend all my time putting this together because it's information that you can use to get your agent who works in your name to do the job they said they would do, the one they promised, they swore or affirmed they would do, to give you ammunition to do that. I did a, cl uh, a class uh, at a college a few weeks ago, and I made a point. Um, this isn't one, but, you know, this is, let's say this is the Constitution. Well, if a senator or a congressman doesn't abide by the Constitution, if the, go if the president or a member of the executive branch doesn't abide by the Constitution, what do you expect? Do you think the Constitution is going to get out of its case, walk up and dope slap them? No. It's the information you need to hold them accountable. That's why we have a Constitution. It's in writing so that you know that you can stand up and say, no, you swore to uphold this. This says you can make no law to do that. How dare you? You've lied to me. You've broken your oath. You are unfit for service. And while I can't impeach you, I can certainly do everything I can to make sure you don't get this job next time. I'll get you fired. And again, when I walk into a congressman's office and say that, they go, yeah, yeah, some crackpot. When I walk in and I have a thousand people on a, on a letter from their district, I get a lot more attention. But again, when we just come in and say, well, I think, well, I think, well, I think, no. Most of them are lawyers, which means they've probably never read the Constitution, certainly never studied the Constitution. They studied con uh, constitutional opinion, what they like to call constitutional law. But when I come in and show them the facts... And I show that the people who hire them know those facts. They start getting a little more interested. 
So let's see. we got about 10 minutes left on the broadcast. Uh, looking to see if there's any new um, comments coming in. Uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting discussion. I agree. There are times I wish I could just, you know, roll up my shutters and go away. Yeah, you know, I've been married. Um, I've been married 31 years to the same woman. And when we first got married, we made a deal. Divorce was not an option. We promised till death do us part, better or worse, sickness and health. We took divorce off the table. And, uh, you know, we had our, our, our difficult times. I mean, uh, uh, we trust me, life wasn't all that hard. I mean, I'm not, I'm not talking about uh, serious things. But, you know, my wife has an illness that makes life difficult. But the interesting thing is since divorce has never been an option, it's never been discussed, it's never been brought up. Once we said it was gone, it was gone. You kind of work harder to make it work. When divorce becomes the easy option, when if you don't get your way, you just threaten a divorce, that union doesn't last long. And whether that's a couple or a union of states, it's true. That's the same. You know, that's that's the same thing. So I'll I'll keep looking at some questions. I'll give you a couple of hints of what uh, I'm planning for the Constitution study uh, through the end of the year. The book I've been through a few publishers, haven't found one that will take the book yet. Uh, looks like I might have to self-publish it. Um, that's a lot of work for me, but. Uh, I'm still working on it, uh, just so you know what I am working on. Um, I have uh, w- one thing I'm trying to do. I actually want to bring in an audience to watch these live stream recordings. I think I've figured it out. Uh, I'm actually hoping that December, I'm actually going to be inviting people to come to the Shelbyville Bedford County Library to actually watch the recording. It means, though, I'm going to have to move these from Wednesday night to Thursday night. So I'm still going to do 6 to 7 Central Time, 7 to 8 Eastern, but I'm going to move it from Wednesday to Thursday so I can do it um, at the library. And I'm doing that for a couple of reasons. One is the library has really, really good Internet access, about 10 times the speed of what I got now. So I'm hoping that I will get a much better stream, Um, not just more resolution, but a smoother stream, a smoother output, fewer hiccups. Uh, You know, that's that's what I'm hoping for. Uh, But also they have a room where I can, again, have people come in because I I think a little bit of live interaction can uh, liven up the discussion. It can liven up the the interaction. So uh, hopefully in December. Uh, you will see a revamped, uh, better looking um, uh, live Facebook presentation for the December. But keep an eye out that I'm moving it from Wednesday to Thursday. So uh, that's that's one thing. Uh, I'm also going to have some uh, I'm looking to stand up a store with some stuff. So that's part of how I'm going to end up selling my book. Um, also going to start selling classes and stuff like that. Again, please head to the website. Um, If you sign up for the newsletter, you'll be notified when uh, I make the when I announce these new features. So uh, please go over there and do that. And I got a question that came in uh, from Bobby. Hello, Bobby. I constantly hear people talking about our leaders. I explain we have no leaders, only employees. Ooh, I like that. And like any employee, they need more than a review every few years. They need daily guidance like any other employee. Well put, Bobby. Yes, our quote-unquote leaders are our employees. Uh, It's funny, I I refer to them as our employees, but I never quite thought of answering uh, our leaders quite that way. But that's, that's I like that. But that's a good point. They work for you. Get your head out of the space that... You work for them, that they have power. You know, we, we do give them authority to pass laws under certain areas, but they work for, we hire them. You know, like I said, I have people that ask me to vet, uh, vet candidates. 
And my first question is, you're going to swear or affirm an oath to do this. Uh, what are you going to do to, to, to support the Constitution? What are you going to do? Why? I'm reviewing an employee, a potential employee. Imagine what would happen to Congress if m more and more American people thought of them as employees than leaders. So, yeah, great line, Bobby. I love it. Uh, but and let's let's keep spreading the word. A um, couple other things you're going to see on the website. So I've been I've engaged with a with a new tool. Um, so you're going to see some changes. I've got I'm trying to come up with some new banners, kind of a nicer, nicer look. Um, but I'm working on putting together online classes. So there's a couple things, sneak previews. Um, you're going to start seeing my books and my which I've been selling through Amazon. You're going to start seeing me, seeing me selling eBooks and stuff through the website. Uh, you're going to start seeing classes coming up through the website. Uh, and um, I'm going to start offering, uh, I've got, I got two membership packages or two membership groups that I'm thinking of putting on the website. One is uh, just a basic, you know, uh, constitution study membership. Uh, I think it's going to be like, Four ninety five a month, and I'll probably offer an annual discount. But um, it's going to have access to all of those, all the basics, the the basic stuff that I put out. So um, I'm gonna, I'm thinking I'm going to put my my eBooks up there. Uh, my uh, what else I'm going to put up there? Uh, probably put up some of the 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 simpler basic. Um, uh, classes that I'll start hosting from there as well. And again, that'll be still, I haven't announced it yet. So this is a free preview. Um, I'm thinking probably like four ninety five a month, uh, four nine ninety five a year, and it'll get you access to all the basic stuff that I'm putting out. And then looking at another pr platform or another membership program that really is an insider. And it's really for those people that kind of want to go to the next level. It's kind of a combination of um, insider and mentor. And the idea being getting access to help me, one, to help understand how I develop some of my content, uh, maybe actually help develop some of the content, get early access to maybe betas of the products I'm working on, um, stuff like that but really designed around this. I want to help people that want to share the message that want to take the, the idea of studying the constitution and they don't, they're consuming it and that's great, but they also want to share it. And, um, it's, uh, it's still in the works. So again, if you follow the newsletter, um, you'll, you'll see when it gets announced, uh, there'll be signups for it. Uh, still working out the details on that, but that's, those are two things I've started working on that uh, I'm hoping people will be really interested in. I'm hoping they're looking again, you know, whether you just want to be kind of part of the study and get access to some basic information, or do you really want to get um, deep inside and really uh, help hone your skills? I will work with you not only to, to more detailed answer your questions, but help you create responses like the one Bobby came up with, uh, which Bobby, I love that. That's, that's a great one. Uh, so that's also what you're going to see on the website. Um, Adam says, that's why a trial by jury is so important because if a jury finds a law unjust, they can and should, and I'm assuming he meant to say ignore it. Uh, yeah, it's called jury nullification. Um, by the way, it's something judges t will, will either not tell you about or tell you that you can't do. But uh, no, if you go back, the in a criminal case, it's interesting. In a criminal case, the jury is considered the judge of law and fact. In a civil case, they're supposedly just the judge of fact. And I've got that in the, I went through that in, in the book. But yeah, understand that for the government to convict you of a crime it's actually they it's not you finding you it's not the government finding you guilty it's the jury which is why jury duty is so important you know the people like to say you're not judged by a jury your peers 
You're judged by 12 people who couldn't get out of jury duty. Uh, jury duty is important. It's a, an important civil, civic function. It is the people maintaining control over their government. Um, and uh, it's, it, 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 again, it's part of what makes this whole thing work. So uh, let's see, I've been yakking for an hour. It's 7 o'clock here, Central Time. Uh, if you live in the Middle Tennessee area, uh, keep an eye out. I'm actually trying to do some live and in-person events down here. If you would like me to come speak at one of your events, either in person or online, please let me know. Contact me through the website. I love, I love doing that. I love meeting with people and having discussions, even if they're not always easy discussions. Most of all, I am glad you spent some time with me. I'm glad you hung out, uh, even with some of what looked like to be glitches in the, in the stream. Um, continue to post questions, comments. I will continue to answer them as I can. And I want to see you again here next time. Hopefully next, on my, next month on my new live stream, that'll be the new and improved Constitution study. And have a wonderful night. Every day.